Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. We need more affordable housing opportunities for local, hardworking families. Our topic for this segment, the impact of zoning on housing affordability. Kimberly Marcos Pine never imagined that she would be elected, an elected official, seeing her community neglected by government leaders in the areas of traffic relief, school funding, and crime motivated her to run for office to ensure that the Leewood Coast would no longer be left behind. Since her election to the Hawaii House of Representatives in 2004, and now as a member of the Honolulu City Council, her district has received over a billion in funding for new roads, schools, parks, beaches, and various community imp improvement projects. Tougher crime laws were also passed. Meet our special VIP guest, Kimberly Marcos Pine, Vice Chair, Honolulu City Council. Welcome to Welcome. Sister wow, Power. Wow, what an introduction. I love this Sister Power show. It's oh, amazing. yay. Well, it's a Sister Power who's sitting in the Sister Power seat. We're so happy to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. And for our Sister Power viewers, just tell us, for instance, today is Thursday. Mm -hmm. What are your responsibilities as soon as you walk into the office on Monday? Okay. Tell us your responsibilities about zoning and housing affordability. Well, of course, my first responsibility is making sure that my dogs are fed in the morning, the stray cats that I adopted outside are fed in my fish, and most importantly, that my, my baby girl feels loved, is fed, and gets to school on time. And then, from being a mama, then I kind of become the mama of my district and now the entire city to make sure that families can afford to live here in Hawaii. My number one mission in being in politics is to ensure that I can improve your quality of life so you can stay here. A large part of my family lives in Vegas because that's where they can live and afford and be happy. And my dream is to make sure that my daughter's generation doesn't suffer like that ever again. So everything that I do, from every meeting that I do, and from morning to the end of the day, is about how do I make people's lives better. I love that. I just had that conversation with a young man, and he said, I'm still living at home with my mom, and I want to move out on my own. So you're the perfect person to have here this week to talk about <laughs> affordable housing. It is so needed here at Hawaii. How do you solve affordable housing in parts, but focus on the whole? Well, there's several things going on. First, within our own system within the city, we have a very outdated and problematic functioning of our Department of Planning and Permitting. So, for example, in a week's time, we're going to finalize a bill to speed up building of single-family homes. There are people, for example, a family in Waipahu that just wanted a slightly bigger house for their multi-generational family, but they've waited a year now for that permit. But they still own the house that they live in in that empty lot in Waipahu. And the dad said, you know, Kim, this process is so long that I'm, I, I either have to go bankrupt, sell this property, or get another job. It shouldn't be like this. So we're looking at the systems within the Department of Planning Permitting that has plagued the department for years. We have great staff, but a lot of things have happened over time that has made it very hard to build an affordable house, even in the private sector. And secondly, what we're doing, what we passed, we passed historic legislation where every developer that builds units of 10 or more now must build affordable homes for the people of Hawaii within their development or just outside somewhere, partner with a nonprofit. And so now that is the law, that if you're going to build in Hawaii, you're going to help others as well. But we have to do our part to help make sure that it's financially beneficial for you to do that. No one's going to build if they lose money. So we also gave them additional densities and incentives 
that would speed up the process as well as financial incentives that they build affordable housing. Okay, well, so let's just back up a, a little mm -hmm. and break it down to our viewers about zoning and okay, housing sure. affordability. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's different needs right now, and half of the need for affordable housing is for a family for that makes a combination of $80,000 a year. Half of the units that we need, we need 24,000 units of affordable housing. Okay, so that's something that includes the lowest levels of, of two people that work at McDonald's, they need a house. And so it, it, ha it ranges up to 80% AMI and below of the $80,000 family of four. So government is helping for people who make 80% and 60% and below, or $60,000 a year in terms of family of four. But what we're doing is for the, the family of four that makes a hundred to $120,000 a year, we're asking the private sector to help government a little bit. And so that would be the working class. And then market rate, which is a family of four making $140,000 or more, um, those are the, the people that can afford something, but we need to get some more supply in the, the middle class area. So it's a little complicated number wise. I hope I simplified that just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that is complicated. <laughs> but, you know, will it sink in? Yeah. You know, be, what I love about Sister Power shows, people, they rewind it and listen to the parts that they don't quite get. So it's all good. What gives you hope in our democratic system? I would have to say seeing my own experience in government gives me hope. You see, I, I've always ran against a machine. I remember my first election running against an incumbent. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just had a heart for my community and I knew things were wrong. Mm. And I went door to door and I talked to people about, let's we can stand up and bring change. We don't have to put up with all of these crime issues, these traffic issues. Um, our schools falling apart, our parks falling apart. We're the bosses here. And I wasn't supposed to win. In my first election, we won by a landslide. Wow. And the $100 million road that we campaigned and fought for that was taken out of um, the state uh, budget for 20 years, we got in our first year. And it wasn't because of anything I did. I told my community, if they want that road, they got to come to the state capitol and fight for it. And people of all walks of life who never got in government before, they came to the Capitol and they backed me up and they fought for this road. They, they said, okay, who's the chair of the finance committees? Okay, which auntie has a nephew or who, who knows or is related to this finance chair? And they on their own had relatives and I think the finance chair's own mother was called. It was friends with another lady from the Eva Beach area. And if people can understand that they can take care over their government, just district by district, that gives me hope. But mm -hmm. they have to know that it can be done. Can be done. Is that one of your favorite accomplishments, or just maybe one of them, or you want to share a second one with us? Well, um, we weren't getting enough money for our schools either. And yes. we were able to in that. And while I was in the legislature, we were in the top 10 of capital improvement projects out of 51 legislators every year that I've been in office. And it's just really about people backing up your elected politician. People think, oh, I'm going to go vote and I'm done. Mm. No, you back that person up and you show up when they need you. That one person alone can't do this. And that is something that can you imagine if ever, there's 51 House districts. If one person in every district gets inspired and inspires 20 people to inspire 20 people, that can start a whole revolution. So when people don't want to vote, they don't want to get involved, I just said, look at me. I was a nobody. I was just someone that had a passion and a spirit to fight for my community. And we won. And you can do it, too. You can do it. Keep hope alive. <laughs> Keep hope alive. I love that. <laughs> Well, Kimberly, why do you think it's important for women to be on our city council? Well, we had something historic happen this year. Okay, tell Another us about it. Another mama, uh, close to my age, ran for city council against what I call the machine. And when I say the machine, they're not necessarily bad people. We have all good people. But it's people that have been in power that choose the leaders who lead us. And she was a, a, a young mom 
that, that was tired of seeing people that she loved, like me, move to the mainland. And he says, I'm going to put my hat in the ring. Her name is Heidi Suniyoshi. Tell me her name is Heidi. Heidi Suniyoshi. She won in the primary outright. So for the first time in the history, in a very powerful city government in Honolulu, we have four women in the city and county of Honolulu City Council. That's never happened before. So women, young women, like my daughter, who's three and a half, they need to see women yes. of all different races and backgrounds and, and ages um, in areas, not necessarily of power, but of influence, so that they can know that they can do whatever they want to do. I never had anyone be my mentor. But I was such a tomboy that I, I saw men and I saw me as being able to do the same thing. That's what my mom just raised me, is not seeing gender as being a problem. And I guess because she knew her struggle. Sure. And so it's important that we step forward no matter how hard it is, because it is hard. It's hard. Well, this is a, 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 a long, detailed question, but one I think should be asked. Some advocates have <laughs> conflated affordable and workforce housing. Mm -hmm. That is combining homelessness, low income and middle class needs together. Does such an approach sufficiently address the complexities of the debate or are cities more successful when they address these issues separately? That's a tough question. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because in all those categories from homelessness, low income, to middle class, working class, that's the 24,000 units that we need, with half of them being in the lower level. Um, you have to see the whole picture. Because when I look at zoning and housing, if I just help homeless and if I just help the um, low income, we still ha have half the people from the middle class to the working class that are not being taken care of. So for example, in Almoana, when I was doing different high rises, I saw what happened in Kaka'aka where it was just all luxury. Yes. And so I said, this is not the Hawaii that's for local people. This is for some other people uh, coming in and having a part-time residence. You you'll see some of the towers at night that are built. There's like maybe eight lights on, right? Everyone else is in another country or somewhere else. And so I said, okay, all Moana we're gonna do different. So in one building, we have 60 units, all for senior citizens at the lowest income rate, okay? So even people that were homeless senior citizens, they can go in there as well, because there's benefits that can go with that. Another building, I said, okay, we're gonna have our millennials affordable housing. So those new workers that just got out of college, you know, we're gonna give you uh, units in this building and then just down the street we're gonna say okay people who want to purchase okay because the other two were rentals so okay. people who want to purchase at the middle income uh, affordable rate we're gonna have a building that you can get into and so that's how I looked at so when I'm looking at the zoning in different areas and see how do we mix this place up so we don't just have one type of per people in a neighborhood you've got to integrate kids especially so they can see different types of lifestyles they the lower income residents can aspire to have a college degree and when when they grow up and get a better job than their parents did and so uh, this is really something you almost have to look at everything all at the same time it's a lot more complicated to do but you can't forget can't forget each different category because what's happening and what's happening with all this the homelessness especially in my district so the prices in town went up so the people that used to go to town are now living in IAEA that prices there went up so then they moved to Eva <coughs> and the prices there went up went to Waianae and so you, if you don't take care of everyone the middle class is going to take the lower income homes We'll hold that thought, and we're going to take a small break <coughs> and take care of that cough with a little water for you. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us and stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon.
Please join us. Aloha. みなさんこんにちは。ティンクテックハワイが日本語でお届けするこんにちはハワイの日本語放送のコスト国末ゆかりです。各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちはハワイ。各週の月曜日2時からぜひ皆さん見てください。ホストの国瀬ゆかりでした。アロハ。Welcome back to Sister Power, and the title of our episode for today is the impact of zoning on housing affordability. And we have our very special guest, Kimberly Marcos Pine, who's the vice chair of the Honolulu Council. City Council, yes.、Yeah. <laughs> and we've been talking about some very important issues on zoning and affordability. And my question to you, Kimberly, is affordable housing hard to build? It's very difficult to build in Hawaii because. Your material costs are higher because you're shipping it in. The land costs are higher because there's so little land. And we also have higher labor costs. And so, how we've tried to do it is government will do, of course, for the lowest of income. And we have the private sector now helping the, the middle class and, and some of the, the lower income residents. Wow, yeah, you know, bringing things from across the water. <clears throat> I guess, as on the cost for everything. Elaborate or explain inclusionary zoning for affordable housing. Well, inclusionary zoning is、um, very similar to what I described and what we had passed earlier.、Uh, it's not very popular with the development community because, and rightfully so, they say, well, you're making us do these. these、um, Affordable homes, so it's just making the prices of the other houses and other units higher. And so, what we did was we tried to find a middle ground where, for every, whenever they do a, a unit s of 10 or more, they have to build a certain percentage of affordable housing. But how we made it better than what other cities did, we said, okay, we're going to speed up your permitting process. We are going to Um, fast track some approvals that are normally required. We're going to give you more density so that you can build more units, go make your profit, but still build the units that we can't afford to build alone. What, so, <clears throat> do you want inclusionary units to be set aside in all new market rate developments or just those of a particular size? Well, actually, we gave people. Options. It's really the square footage. If they want to do a studio instead of a two bedroom unit, if they feel that the market for their, their particular product is better for studios, we don't, we don't care. It's really the square footage that we want you to provide that equals the amount that by law you have to build. By law?、Mm -hmm. All right. Well, tell us about the two, I don't know if they're two new projects, the No Hana, Holly, and Kulana Holly Housing. Tell us about those affordable housing projects. Well, those projects are for the lowest level income residents on our island. Some so, of them will be just homeless straight off、oh, the street. Okay.、Um, but we have some subsidies from the federal government, the city government, the state government that we will provide to help them to have that home. But also, you don't just get a free ride, you know, you have to have your own income too and make an effort if you're able. Um, if you're you know, mentally ill or have health issues, of course, we always want to help those citizens. And those people, many of them have access to Social Security that they had paid up their whole life. And just at the end of their life, they've had some issues.、Uh, so units can go as low as $500 a month. Wow.、Mm -hmm. Now, in the unit, what comes with the unit? I mean, is it a one bedroom, two bedroom? Wash and dryer, or you, do you go downstairs to do your laundry?、Uh, the, the laundry rooms will be in a separate area, and、okay. that's how we're able to afford. In some of these areas, we're combining buying of construction material with other large for profit companies so that it's a more affordable to build. There's studios, there's one bedroom, and it's a couple of units, there's just three bedroom homes. 
and well, that's actually it's like more like apartments. It's, oh. it's, it's not like single family home. And there's also going to be like park areas so that the kids can play and we're going to have access to uh, a lot of things for the kids so that they make sure that they have good after school programs. Well, that's good. Have you done an assessment of the housing need across income levels in our community to know how many new units are needed and what level of affordability? Yes, and so there's, there's the 24,000 units that we need just for Oahu. We're not even talking about the Big Island or, or Maui or any, we need 24,000 units in all different affordable categories. For the lowest of income, we need uh, 12,000 units. And, and sadly, in Ala Moana alone, I've really only just did a couple thousand units, but that's a lot more than we used to do. It used to be like just 500 um, total houses a month. And that that's includes everybody, even the higher income ones. So we've made a lot of strides in this last year that we've been a chair of zoning and housing. And so we really think that our effort combined with the state's effort is really going to help um, pick up the pace for all these affordable housing units to be built. Well, that's good to know because you are having an event November the 15th, and we have a yeah, just a snippet of it. And I think that this is a good time if people have additional questions so they can come and meet and speak with you. Tell me about this event on November, is that the the 13th, yeah, November 13th, 13th, they can come and talk to me at J Dynasty Restaurant. You know, they it is kind of a high-end fundraiser, but I want to let you guys know the hint about these fundraisers. It's suggested donation. Oh, you can still come. And sure. all my fundraisers, I don't require people to pay. It's like, if you can help out, great. But it really is a time for us to, to celebrate the successes of the four women that are going to be on the council starting in January. And so it's a week after election, and we're just going to be kind of be there to answer your questions, and we're just be so happy to see you there. Oh, I I definitely want to attend that. And Sister it's in the Power is yeah. in the evening. <laughs> it's in and the what, is, what time? It's from five to seven. Five to seven. So right after work, you can yep. just stop right by mm -hmm. Dynasty. Yes. And yes. meet and greet and chat with you yes. and give you some ideas, yes. and we can learn from each other. Yes, I would love to have that, and I'm I'm very excited. I know. Uh, a lot of women in Hawaii felt very sad that some of the top female candidates didn't win. Yes. But the Honolulu City Council was kind of the, the sleeper that no one knew about. All these women were fighting in these their own areas and, and not winning because they're women. They're winning because they were smart, they were hardworking, and they loved the people that they represent. And that is how they got elected. And they're going to bring a different type of leadership to the City Council. Well... <laughs> I'm excited. Are there other factors I'm not taking into consideration that I should be on this issue? Is there something that I'm not asking that you would like the public to know about that is close to your heart, that's a passionate issue that you want to let the Sister Power viewers know about? Well, in terms of affordable housing, I want to let them know that we are making a lot of gains. And to not lose hope, that you have to, you know, that, that you're not going to be able to stay in Hawaii. We're, we're doing a lot of stuff to make sure that you stay here. And we're, we're not there yet, but we're heading in the right direction. And in terms of women leaders, I just want to encourage everyone to, to take that chance to know that you're the best person to run, not this other person. And it doesn't, you don't have to have any experience whatsoever. You just have to be uh, strong in what you believe in, love the people that you want to represent, mm -hmm. and just go for it. You don't have to have all of these lobbyists backing you and these big money people, because I didn't have that in my first race. Who was your role model? I didn't have one. You didn't have one? I didn't have one. I just had to make my own because there weren't any real women leaders when I was growing up. You know, I had Oprah Winfrey and I was supposed to be a talk show host like you and I, oh. I majored in journalism and English at, at UC Berkeley and I was supposed to be on TV, but I saw what was happening in my commute and I said, you know what, I can't live another day unless I do something and, and I can't get someone else to run so I'm going to do it myself and I wasn't supposed to win, but we surprisingly won because the people helped us to get there. Tell us your districts. 
My district right now on the Honolulu City Council is from Eva Beach, Kapolei, Kailailoa, Makakilo, all the way to Waianae and Maka. It's oh, one of the largest areas. districts. Yes. And Ko'olina. And Ko'olina, one of my favorite places. <clears throat> How might and can cities in the position of Honolulu create policies that address scarce, scarcity in affordable housing? Well, I think what, what we've been doing is um, making sure that we, we build more in the urban core where all of our transportation systems are at. And what we're doing now, too, is we are looking at ag land for our ag workers. That's something that I forgot to mention early on, not to build these luxurious homes like those, those fake farms, but this is actually for agricultural workers. And so what cities have done is they've done the inclusionary zoning. Where they failed was not giving the incentives to developers to actually build. So a lot of development stopped all across. And even on Honolulu, when our inclusionary zoning was not incentivizing the developers to build, so they would just sit on land. And so we're doing a lot of things to incentivize people to build more housing. But this has been so informative, Vice Chair Kimberly Markles Pine. And we're coming to a close. Oh, wow, that's so fast. It's so fast. <laughs> we just have to come back and talk on November the 13th. We can chat with you more. And thank you so much for taking the time to stop by and educate us about zoning and housing affordability. Finally, Sister Power is coming to a close now. And I wanted to chat about very briefly that we only have five days before we are to vote. Yes. And that is just something that I want everyone to get out, get your children out, get, if you need to carpool or whatever it takes, that if you get out there and vote on November 6th, we can change the world. Yes, we can. We can. And so again, <laughs> thank you for spending part of your day with Sister Power. Aloha.